sound and logical. Viewer discretion advised. Psalm 137 verse 9. Psalm 137 verse 9. Psalm 137 verse 9. Do you agree with this? Civilized societies have learned that treating people as property is one of the worst evils one human can inflict upon another. Yet there are plenty of biblical references to God condoning and even ordering slavery. For instance, your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clans born in your country, and they will become your property. You can will them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life. That makes God's position quite clear, but it goes even further than that. If a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as men's servants do. Yes, God actually condones fathers selling their daughters into slavery to pay off debts. Some people claim that slavery wasn't as horrible in biblical times as it was in more recent centuries, but that's not what the Bible says. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. In other words, it doesn't matter how cruel your master is, Whatever he orders you to do, you have to do. And if that doesn't convince you, then consider this. If a man beats his male or female slave with a rod, and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. But he is not to be punished if the slave gets up after a day or two, since the slave is his property. That means it's perfectly fine to beat a slave as viciously as you want, as long as he or she can recover well enough to stand within a couple of days. Furthermore, most translations of the Bible, including the King James Version, imply that it's even okay if the slave dies as long as he or she lingers a day or two before dying. Does it still sound like slavery wasn't so bad in biblical times? Today we consider pedophilia to be a particularly evil form of child abuse. During biblical times, girls were typically married off around puberty, often without consent, and they commonly gave birth shortly thereafter. Oftentimes, the husbands were much older than their young wives. Just because cultures were different in biblical times doesn't mean we should consider it acceptable that they married off their 12-year-old daughters to 35-year-old men. After all, slavery was considered perfectly acceptable then too, yet today we know such behavior is wrong regardless of cultural context. And if we know pedophilia, like slavery, is wrong, then God, being all-knowing, should know it's wrong too. Yet he did not forbid it. The Bible contains no minimum age limits on sex or marriage, and thus it's reasonable to conclude he condones adults having sex with children, as long as they're married. Furthermore, God decreed that fathers could sell their young daughters into slavery, and virginal girls were worth much more than those who had had sex before. It doesn't take a genius to know that the only reason virgins were worth more was because the men they were sold to would get to deflower them. Rape is an unusually cruel act of violence that no good person would ever justify or consider acceptable. Yet God condones and even orders rape throughout the Bible. One example is, Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known a man by lying with him. But all the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Here, God orders his soldiers to keep the virginal female children after slaughtering their mothers, fathers, and brothers. First, Consider what the soldiers would have done to those women and girls to decide which were virgins and which weren't. That alone can be construed as rape. And second, what do you think those soldiers were expected to do with those girls? Some biblical apologists insist God does not condone rape, but God also supposedly does not condone theft and murder either, yet in the same chapter he orders his soldiers to commit both. Does anyone seriously believe those girls had any choice in what happened to them, sexually or otherwise? 
In another example, Lot offered his own virginal daughters to a crowd to rape. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. This coming from a man the Bible describes as just and righteous, and delivered just Lot, for that righteous man dwelling among them vexed his righteous soul. And here God says he will give David's wives to another man to rape. This is what the Lord says, Out of your own household I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. It's yet another example of how God's idea of justice is to punish the guilty by making innocence suffer. It wasn't David's wives who offended God, it was David, yet they were the ones who were raped. And here's something that's even creepier. If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married, and rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay the girl's father fifty shekels of silver. He must marry the girl, for he has violated her. As any rape victim will tell you, nothing would be more horrifying than being forced to marry her own rapist. Yet that's exactly what God orders. I've heard some biblical defenders say this is better than having the victim remain unmarried because no one would want a violated woman. As if an all-powerful God couldn't come up with a better solution than forcing her to spend the rest of her life with her own rapist. Think about it. Being good is about protecting the innocent not abusing them. Considered a social taboo and a crime in most countries, incest is nevertheless something God apparently condones. The aforementioned Lot, again whom the Bible regards as just and righteous, twice got drunk and had sex with his daughters. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. But here's a better example of God condoning incest. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. Everyone descended from Eve, which means that for her children to reproduce, they had to commit incest. This was evidently fine with God, since he did not provide any alternate lineages with which they could reproduce, and they had no choice but to commit incest. The same is true for Noah and his family. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. God expected just eight people to repopulate the earth after the flood, and thus it was impossible for generations that followed to avoid committing incest. Again, God had to condone incest, or otherwise he would have provided additional lineages so Noah and his family could avoid it. Although most people can understand resorting to cannibalism if the only alternative is starving to death, it's still considered one of the most repugnant acts one can commit. But God threatened to force people who worshipped other gods to do just that. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters. And? But if, despite this, you disobey me, I in turn will punish you myself sevenfold for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. Who would even think of forcing people to eat their own children? What justification would a good God have for even considering something so horrible? Violating someone's trust can be among the most destructively evil of behaviors, yet God condones various forms of betrayal. Jesus testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. Then he, Jesus, said, Here I am, I have come to do your, God's, will. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. God required someone to betray Jesus so he would be murdered, thus making him the human sacrifice God required before he would forgive humanity its sins. Salvation founded on betrayal. But God also betrays people more directly. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these miraculous signs of mine among them. God supposedly gave people free will so they could make their own choices, and then he deliberately hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that he wouldn't let the Israelites go. 
And then because Pharaoh didn't let them go, God murdered every firstborn male in Egypt. Some biblical apologists insist God just used Pharaoh's behavior for his own purposes, and that it was still Pharaoh's choice to ignore Moses. Except that God admits that he himself hardened Pharaoh's heart specifically in order to have a reason to perform his miracles. If he hadn't, there would have been no need to kill anyone. God also betrayed Adam and Eve. He created them innocent, unaware of the difference between good and evil, and told them to follow one rule. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Then God put a serpent in the garden with them. Being all-knowing, God of course knew exactly what the serpent would tell them about eating the fruit from the tree of knowledge. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Since Adam and Eve didn't yet know the difference between good and evil, they could not have known it was wrong to believe the serpent or that they should obey God. Only after they ate the fruit did they become aware of right and wrong. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So God betrayed them by deliberately putting them into a situation where he knew they would do the wrong thing without their even being capable of knowing it was wrong and then punishing them for it. Finally, God betrays all humanity by allowing Satan to roam free on earth. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. For he is a liar and the father of lies. If God lets Satan deceive people by confusing and misleading them, how is it just for God to punish people for being confused and misled? Wouldn't a good God do everything possible to make sure everyone has a clear understanding of what is true and what is deception? What good reason is there to confuse people who might otherwise be perfectly willing to do what God wants? Lying may seem like perhaps the least evil act on the list, considering it's something everyone does in one way or another, even if it's just the occasional white lie. But when you consider that the Bible is meant to be a guide for one's entire life, it's actually perhaps the most disturbing to learn that God doesn't always tell the truth. In one instance, God told Abraham he wanted him to murder his own son, when the truth was he had no intention of having Abraham go through with it. Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. I'm sure Isaac was relieved God had deceived Abraham, but God still lied. In another example, after the flood, God says he will never again destroy the earth. Never again will I curse the ground because of man. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Only later the Bible makes it clear God will destroy the earth again. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Everything will be destroyed in this way. Of course, biblical apologists interpret these verses to mean God will never again destroy all living creatures with a flood, but then later says he will instead do it with fire, which is about as meaningful and honest as a man saying he'll never beat his wife again, and then later cutting her instead. Finally, God also deceived the prophets and made them lie. So now the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. If God lies, then how can we be sure that anything he claims in the Bible is actually true? We're forced to accept the possibility that the Bible contains falsehoods, and thus nothing in it can be fully trusted. The biblical evidence I have presented here is far from complete, but it should be sufficient to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that God is guilty of condoning or committing virtually all the behaviors we ourselves consider the most evil. Murder and genocide, animal and human sacrifice, torture, child abuse, animal abuse, theft, slavery, pedophilia, rape, incest, cannibalism, betrayal, lying, 
this should be evident to any rational, civilized person who actually reads the Bible without rose-tinted glasses. Of course, none of this is going to convince a fanatic, someone who's decided God is good no matter what the direct, obvious evidence indicates. Some of them acknowledge that God's actions appear deeply evil, but they just trust that he must be good despite all the evidence to the contrary while others will stop at nothing to find some way to twist and creatively reinterpret God's actions to be something other than evil, no matter how much of a stretch it takes. They will often desperately dig around through the many contradictions found in the Bible, looking for something, anything, they can use to convince themselves negates the scripture indicating God is evil. Like a, a battered housewife defending her abusive husband. Who has the best girlfriend ever? I do. Who just bought you all this stuff? She did. And all the stuff? My girl bought all of it and I'm about to eat this and then we're gonna chow on that after. So, mm. happy Easter. Yeah, <laughs> but we're not eating at all. Just know that, cause we gotta save some. Yeah. You know? Budget cuts, you know? <laughs> Save, save, save. You know? So we're gonna scoff this stuff down. Cause, Relax. cause Boo deserved it. <laughs> you know? Even though we get in our arguments sometimes, I still love you, okay? I love you too. Yeah. I love you too, baby. Yeah, you, you better. <laughs> so I just spent some money on you. Yeah. <laughs> some even make up non existent events that must have happened to turn what appears clearly evil into something good, even though there are passages throughout the Bible that warn against this. Every word of God is flawless. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Because fanatics are irrational by definition, this video wasn't made for them, but instead for Christians and non-Christians capable of critical thinking. And to them I say, even if you're the sort of person who's willing to give God the benefit of the doubt, willing to put the best possible spin on his behavior, many of the biblical verses I quoted should still make you think twice about whether the literal God of the Bible is good. Then ask yourself if a good, moral person should worship a being who commits genocide, who slaughters innocent children, who orders his people to murder their own friends and family, who demands having animals and even humans sacrificed to him, who plans to torture people forever, who abuses children and animals, who is indifferent to adults having sex with children, who tells his people to steal and enslave others, who advocates severely beating slaves, who orders women to be raped and makes rape victims marry their rapists, who requires people to commit incest, who threatens those he doesn't like with cannibalism of their own children, who manipulates others so they do the wrong thing and then punishes them severely for it, who betrays those closest to him, and who lies to and deceives everyone? By our own standards, God is profoundly immoral. Yet Christian fundamentalists believe you should worship him. Are you that willing to sell out your own sense of morality to follow such a monster? If so, then don't be surprised if atheists, non-Christian theists, and even Christians who aren't fundamentalists consider you morally bankrupt. Because if that behavior is good, then good has no meaning. And for anyone who still thinks God isn't evil, answer me the following question. What acts would God have to commit for you to consider him evil? If you can't answer that, then you can't claim to be a person of sound moral judgment, can you? Think about it. Psalm 137 verse 9 Psalm 137 verse 9 Psalm 137 verse 9 
37 verse 9 concubines <laughs> as the, the word that everybody knows right so uh, which are female slaves and to some modern terms sex slaves right so the thing is they weren't actually called sex slaves to be fair that's the modern media calling them that but traditionally they were slaves okay so female slaves uh, or you could call them concubines or whatever now you see I have explained in my previous video on slavery, which is on YouTube, that I've explained that the day and age, we've got to understand the mindset. Islam did not take on slavery, did not tackle it by the horns, because it would have felt that it was a mission that would, one, compromise the actual mission it came for, and two, it was not to be achieved in that day and age because the general collective consciousness of a people just will not embrace it. Now, we may feel that, yeah, that sounds strange because it does to us in this day and age. Whatever, and she's got this coat on. Or, this is an old lady, that's her nose, that's her mouth, lips and her chin. And this is her kind of hat and she's kind of got a sunken head. She's looking kind of like down. So this is a reversible image or a ambiguous picture, it's called in psychology as well. It's from an optical illusion. But the point is once, sometimes you can only see one, but the moment you see the other, you can no longer unsee it. Psalm 137 verse nine. sound and logical.